Hello and welcome to Dream Job Ready. My name is Dane Sharp, I'm your host, and my special guest for this episode is Scott Randall. Scott has worked for Oakley, one of my favorite brands, for over 15 years, and has recently taken on a new dream job with the company as Director of Global Category Strategy for Oakley Sunglasses. Please note that the opinions of guests are their own and not those of the companies they have worked for. This is Dream Job Ready with Dane Sharp. G'day, Scott. Thank you so much for joining me as a guest on the Dream Job Ready podcast. We've got a lot to discuss today, mate, a 16-year tenure at the amazing brand Oakley. Um, but you've got a new dream job, started in February. Um, tell us what your new gig is, mate. Yeah, g'day, Dane. Thanks for having me, mate. I'm uh, humbled and stoked to be on the program, mate. I've uh, been listening to a couple of these already. So, yeah, you hit the nail on the head, mate. Um, just uh, coming up 16 years with uh, the amazing brand of Oakley and just started in a new role as um, Director of Global Category Strategy for Sunglasses. So pretty much responsible for the biggest part of our uh, global business. So, mate, I'd ask you how you got that job, but I think <laughs> we have to start way back, uh, as I said, 16 years ago. How did you get your first dream job um, with Oakley? Yeah, so I started off back in uh, 2004, which still makes me kind of feel really old now. Um, but yeah, started off pretty much ground floor, mate. Got in at um, the in-house sales level, you know, taking phone calls, looking after the reps and stuff like that. And, you know, at that point in time, um, having just left Nike and stuff, it was a great, you know, another really strong brand that I'd always kind of had a strong affiliation for. So I was stoked to be able to get on on the on the team, I guess, nice and early and um, start from the ground up and things just kind of kept snowballing from there, you know, through in-house sales, managed that team for a couple of years, then moved into kind of a bit more wholesale sales, customer facing roles with some key accounts work um, and then into more of the product management side of things. So that lasted me, I guess, kind of seven or eight years um, in Australia and then got an opportunity to come across to the States and been here ever since and had a few roles on this side as well through different program managements and different category management roles as well. Perfect. So, yeah, so you're based in America now, uh, obviously started with Oakley and started your career, I guess, in, in Australia back in the day. Um, you know, it's it's been very sales and you started on the floor, I think you told me. So, you know, was it a dream to work for a brand like Oakley? And we'll, we'll get to the Nike part because I heard you drop that in a minute. We'll get to that in a minute. But was it a dream <laughs> to work for a brand like Oakley ever since you, I guess, started, you know, banging uh, registers? Yeah, honestly, it was probably even before that. I guess growing up in um, Torquay back down on the surf coast, you know, growing up with the likes of Quickie and Rip Curl staying down, starting down there and um, the guy who had the first license, Eve Oakley, actually lived down the street. So kind of always knew the brand from a, a little whippersnapper and it had a dear place in my heart and I know, just kind of always grabbed me in some way. Um, so certainly, you know, to work for the brand was for sure always a, a dream. Um, little did I think that you could go from answering phones in one of our smallest global markets to be able to essentially run the uh, global product line for all of Sun. So it's, it's been a wild ride and a, a huge amount of amazing experiences along the way. Now that's awesome. Um, g- give us some detail about the day-to-day that you're doing with your role now. Like what do you do? Who do you work with? What's your team look like? Yeah, so it's a... I mean, the thing that I really love about the product side of things is just the diversity you get to really work with, mate. It's, you know, we're essentially responsible for the long-term view of the category, so call that two to five years. Um, so that's really partnering with R&D, design, um, you know, and then also crafting, I guess, you know, what are our strategic pillars for the category that we want to try and grow um, our business around. But it's also pretty diverse in the fact that, you know, we've got a new product line manager, two associate product line managers, and then someone who's kind of looking after our, our assortment and life cycle management side of things. So that's my, I guess, core group supported by business analytics and some product operations, which is the data entry product management side of things. But then you start going through the creative process and, you know, that encompasses engineering and manufacturing and all those types of people that like to tell you, no, things can't be done or it's going to be late. Um, And then into the more creative side of, you know, brand, product marketing, sports marketing, and being able to get athlete inputs into the product development or working with the brand team in terms of how we're going to go to market with a certain product, particular collection or release timing. 
And then last but by no means least, I guess, is our commercial entities as well. So that could be any of the sales teams back home in Australia to Brazil, to India, Europe, and obviously our domestic market here in the US as well. So it's pretty diverse and days are pretty choppy in terms of the content we can cover, um, but it's also super, super interesting. When it comes to working with such a diverse uh, group of people and, and um, you know, categories and departments and businesses, from a skill set point of view, what, what do you hope and what do you really want others, I guess, to bring to the uh, situation for you? Like what do you hope people have and, and what do you demand people to have in your role? Yeah, I think honestly one of the biggest things, just an open mind, um, particularly in some of the functions that are pretty linear in terms of what they look after, you'll get someone who might come to the table from engineering or manufacturing and it's like, this is my job, this is my role and this is all I need to do and that's kind of their strong point of view. So being able to, you know, I guess really take that capability to really listen with um you know, other people, that's kind of a skill set that I try and embody myself, but it's something that I really appreciate when others kind of show up in that way um, because it just does help breed a lot better um, working relationship and environment. I think, um, you know, being a bit pragmatic, obviously as a strong brand, you want to be able to take those brand push moments to the market, but that's been one of my challenges coming from the commercial side into the brand push side is how do you balance that equation out of things we want to do and take a stand and you know it's the old Henry Ford example people aren't going to ask for a faster horse Um, same with the eyewear you know it's us trying to go and understand consumers problem statements and be able to interpret those in meaningful ways and what about your skill set mate what uh, do you have today that you didn't have when you um, you know first started your career um definitely a global scope (laughs) for sure um that's been the big thing um but i think just that more holistic part of the business i think if i go back started as you said earlier in retail on the shop floor slinging shoes to people and then it was you know into more phone sales sales so it was a pretty linear path to some degree um but it was really holistic in terms of yeah retail sales product marketing um from a arm's distance I guess not being in there and curating campaigns and all that sort of stuff but really pretty holistic in where I've been able to kind of become pretty rounded in terms of a a broad skill set so I think that that's just taken time to acquire a lot of those different things Um, but for me that's probably one of my strengths. Did you have a career plan when you started at Oakley did you expect to be where you are now? Uh, Uh I guess it probably started before then, I guess, when I was back at uni and, you know, um, <laughs> coming out of high school, we, I had a friend who was working at Nike who's kind of turned into one of my mentors over the journey a little bit. But, um, you know, he was in sports marketing for Nike, living what looked like the dream life, you know, for the kids probably nowadays don't even remember Jerry Maguire, the movie, but I was like, you know, thinking that was my career trajectory with sports marketing and all the fun stuff. But... When I sort of started working in retail, I really developed a, a pretty strong passion for products and understanding why they were made the way they were, what were all the sort of technical details and really gravitated to that, particularly in the sports side of things. I don't know if I could go and do it for washing machines or something as, uh, you know, I guess every day is that. But for me, just growing up, being fairly heavily involved in sport throughout my life, that product categories really just spoke to me and I always kind of wanted to know more. Um, You know, there was always the next step. There was always another dream job that I was kind of chasing, I guess, for sure. But like I said earlier, man, there's no way I could have ever imagined getting to where I've managed to over this this time. And I think it's at times, I guess, when I got my first jobs, it was really about like comparing myself to others. You know, guys were earning a hundred grand and here I was kind of, you know, just sort of working for a great brand, but you know, it was hard to not kind of get down on yourself a little bit, but um, that's been, I think, the big thing with my career is just like the trajectory and the cadence of those changes have just happened at different times for different people and stuff. So there was a plan there, but it happened in different ways than I certainly ever expected. What about new starters at Oakley? What advice would you give uh, a listener that wants to work for the brand? Yeah, good question, mate. It's um, something that you kind of, I guess, get a lot from different people around the place. 
Um, I guess for me, there's, you know, being able to understand, I guess, the, the culture of the place and the organisation, um, you know, that's probably one of the big things that really helps people come in. It's not saying that you need to be a world-class athlete or anything, but having that mentality of a, or mindset of an athlete where it's that innate curiosity to make yourselves better, that's the exact same for us and what we do with product every day. It's that kind of curiosity and trying to understand. Um, so, you know, there's ways you can kind of get into the brand. Like I said, we're part of a huge multinational organisation. We're just one brand in a portfolio. Um, so we've got vertical retail, the likes of Sunglass Hut and OPSM, um, that you can then take lateral moves internal of the organisation. But honestly, we've seen... A bunch of sales reps at home come out of surf stores and golf shops and places like that as well. And then there's your more traditional ways, I guess, of LinkedIn profiles, websites, etc., and applying through there. But, you know, it's a pretty small industry, as you probably well know as well, mate, that the networking side of things just goes such a long way. And once you kind of get in there and start meeting people, it's pretty amazing where that can take you. What's your, your quick advice on networking? Um... I mean, for me, the ironic part of it is it's happened pretty naturally. Um, like I said, I think the part of the organisations and the brands I've worked for just breed this really amazing culture that attracts a lot of like-minded people. And I've got friends still today, you know, as much as I hate to say this, 20 years ago when I started working with Nike that I still catch up with and keep in contact with. And I think it's, for me, you just kind of end up gelling with these people over time. For sure, there's been times where I've gone out of my way to try and meet people who I felt would be able to bring value and insight. Um, but it was, you know, I guess it's a really important part. And for me, the more authentic it can kind of come across, you'd be amazed at what people will give back. Um, you know, when you're just a little junior kind of starting out, people have just, you know, will bend over backwards to help people out that really show that um, desire to kind of better themselves and, you know, if that's capable to do that inside an organisation, great. But there's also been, you know, pretty honest people that are like, hey, maybe your next step does need to be considered out of here as well. So, you know, it's a, the beauty of, I guess, your career over time as well. People kind of spider web off and it's pretty amazing just how your network kind of grows organically from people you've worked with. Yeah, I, I agree with all that, mate. And I think it's really interesting. It's it's hard to understand when you're young that um, you know people are, are willing and trying to help you uh, a lot of the times, yeah. and you sort of get nervous that you don't really know much, you don't want to waste someone else's time, etc. But to your point, most people are really willing to kind of go that extra mile and you know, give you a suggestion or point you in the right way. So I think that's really um, important for a listener to understand. Um, what about mentors? Do do you have mentors? Um, I guess not in the traditional sense where I, though, I kind of set up, you know, very structured and formal um, check-in points with people, but certainly through my time, like I said, you know, one of the guys um, back home um, has, you know, had a phenomenal career and has had the chance to work and continues to work with some of Australia's leading athletes from a coaching standpoint. Um, and just someone I've always admired, but he's always been really giving of his time um, with me and, very pragmatic and, you know, not always telling you what you want to hear, but he's really good at just getting you to think a little bit differently about who you are, what do you want to be and stuff like that. So he's been one um, that's been, I guess, a, a mainstay through my entire career. But then also I, if there's been a couple of guys through Oakley as well, um, particularly when I was back home making this shift to the US. Um, two guys in particular, particularly kind of, gave me or helped really facilitate the opportunity that wasn't given, but they helped facilitate that. But then we're really there to help support and really help me grow as an individual, both personally, but also professionally as well. Um, and just being able to pick their brains, both of them, um, one ironically had also worked with um, at Nike at a separate time. Um, but another guy who he'd actually worked here in the US, had run media companies and had a wealth of experience and for a pretty senior exec was really um, very giving of his time and experience and suggestions and stuff as well. It's pretty magic uh, to have Nike as a, as a company straight up on your resume. How, how did that all come about? How did you get your first job with Nike? 
Yeah, it was, um, again, like the guy who I kind of knew there helped, I guess, tee up an interview. Um, it was for a casual sales assistance role at the Australian Open Tennis of all places. So, um, you know, it was a group interview. He was like, got me the, I guess, interview opportunity and there was probably 50 or 60 or more people trying out for a handful of spots to, you know, basically try and sell shoes at the tennis when most people are, you know, more focused on drinking Heineken than anything else, to be honest. Um, but it was, you know, that kind of just opened the door. And from there, you know, I just, honestly, I just busted my ass in those two and a half weeks, took every opportunity. What were the extra things I could help with? Stay late, you know, um, you'd have the sports marketing managers coming in asking for pairs of shoes for athletes or whoever. Um, and that actually opened a door of a role into retail on the back of that. So at that time, I was moving to Melbourne from Torquay and had an opportunity then to work retail. Um, on a part-time basis with the guys. So it was, yeah, pretty pretty cool experience is my first job. <laughs> I love that, mate. That's awesome. You know, you, you can't in your wildest dreams write down on a piece of paper or on a two-week temp job uh, at, at an event that's going to lead on to, you know, a long uh, and, and, you know, awesome career that you've had. That's so good. I think there's, there's such a key message. It comes out plenty uh, about, you know, taking that opportunity. And if you get an opportunity like that, whether it looks glossy or not, um, yeah. make the most of it, right? Oh, 100%, mate. And honestly, sometimes, like you said, those glossy opportunities are the ones where you're like, oh, actually, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. Or, you know, with every dream job, you know, yes, there's the dream for sure. And we're, you know, I'm super fortunate to be doing what I'm doing. But, you know, is there parts of the day where you're like, oh, not this or not that or whatever? Absolutely. I mean, we're we're still human at the end of the day. Um, but I think you're right, you know, just those opportunities, you just never know where they can lead you. So, you know, for me, that's absolutely one of the best pieces of advice I think that I would give someone is, you know, just stay open-minded. Doesn't mean you have to say yes all the time, but really think through where it could potentially take you. And if you do decide to take it, then just give it your all and that'll ultimately determine what that opportunity can yield down the track anyway. I want to jump to this week's listener question of the week because uh, given you've had, you know, two very famous, amazing global brands as, as kind of your, your pillars uh, in your career, I actually uh, I got a, some really nice messages off um, a few different people over the last couple of weeks and one of them uh, who's working in retail, uh, Simon, I went back to him and I, I specifically told him I was going to chat with you um, given the brands you work for. Um, and his question, uh, which we sort of moulded together, if I can ask you, was what's the most important thing you've learnt from each of those brands that you've worked for, Nike and Oakley? Yeah, good, good question, Simon. Um, yeah, I think it's a, there's a multitude of things. I think one I kind of touched on earlier was just like the value of organisational culture in the workplace and just how powerful that can be, um, not only from delivering results, but just how fulfilling it can be to work with like-minded people um, the other things that I kind of would say is one around navigating and embracing change. Um, both of those organisations don't stay in front by following the status quo and keeping things the same. Um, at times it can be scary, to be perfectly honest. There's been reorganisations, there's been a whole range of different things. For me personally, moving overseas, you know, there's, but those, those changes, you know, being able to front up to those and accept those challenges um, can really be super rewarding, but definitely the more you can embrace that when it happens and be comfortable with being uncomfortable, you know, it's a bit corny, but it's honestly, it's so, so true. Um, and the last one I would say is probably, you know, like any good athlete, having situational awareness. Um, honestly, it's kind of, you know, it can be twofold. One can be like in my role or in, the, I guess, a an organisation, it's about competitive landscape, what's going on externally that could be seen as a, a threat or an opportunity, but it's also from an individual standpoint not to become complacent, you know, make sure you kind of know what's going on around you and not sort of rest on your laurels that, okay, cool, I've done a good job for five years, I'm just going to sit back and cruise till the next promotion falls in my lap. It's like, no, 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 you know, take, take that accountability and use that as the opportunity to really do that. So for me, that's kind of that situational awareness, navigating and embracing change and the power of organisational culture when you find a place you jive with can be, you know, transformational. That's that's great, mate. Situational awareness, that's a new one for me. I haven't actually heard that term. I really like it. 
Um, what, yeah. What's is that something you have to just learn on the fly, or you know, have you been guided to that by someone else? Where, where does that come from? Um, no, I don't know. I guess it's just like I said, just that that analogy of just thinking like an athlete, and like I said before, part when you think about joining these brands, it's like not literally being the athlete, but the mindset of being an athlete is kind of what's in there. And for me, if you look at the world's best surfers, the world's best footy players, whatever sports they're in, their capability to see the unseen, you know, to read the swell, know when the next wave's coming and where to sit in the lineup, to be able to spot a gap in traffic if you're running around playing football. Um, Formula One drivers, a passion of mine, you know, watching those guys race it, you know, hundreds of kilometres an hour um, and making, you know, minute adjustments. For me, it's just that awareness of you in an organisation as an individual is something that you can control and there's not a lot of these things in the world that you can control, which is pretty relevant right now. Um, but, you know, to be a really good category manager, having that awareness of the external, it can be so easy to fall into the trap of this is my brand, this is all I need to know and know it well open your horizons and watch out for the little brands that are growing and showing up and doing the hard yards at trade shows and trying to be disruptive. And, you know, to me, that's just the, it just falls under this broader umbrella of that situational awareness. Cool, mate. Can, can I ask you about decision-making? It must be super yeah, sure. important in your role. Um, I, I'm guessing you haven't got it right every single time in your career. Um, Correct. Talk, talk to me about being a decision maker and the importance of, uh, you know, going, going with it. Yeah, it's, um, I guess there's a couple of things to it. For me, there's, I'm pretty pragmatic is, is the way I tend to approach things. It would be pretty thorough, pretty analytical. So I like to try and, I guess, gather a fair amount of information before I do pull the trigger, um, especially now that, decisions suddenly have millions or tens of millions of dollars of implications um you kind of start to be a little more thorough and a little more diligent (laughs) um but there's also that creative component as well you know particularly as you start to think through things with these big brands around what are we trying to achieve from a brand standpoint um because not all of that's super tangible and super linear in the way you kind of think about those things um, so for me, it's that almost the balance of left brain, right brain skills in that sense. It's being able to truly, again, look at those things pretty holistically in terms of what are all the inputs I need to gather. Um, and there's definitely space for creativity in that zone. But ironically, mate, when I get outside of work, I'm the worst decision maker. If you speak to my wife, she'll tell you I'm the world's biggest procrastinator. So <laughs> maybe not the best person to ask on decision making in general. <laughs> Bit bit of yin and yang is never bad, though. Mate. Exactly. <laughs> just just on your decision to go overseas, I'd love to uh, chat about that really quickly because it's an option, you know, that comes up a fair bit for for some people. Um, but it does make you nervous occasionally. Um, there's a fear of going over there and it all collapsing and imploding and oh my god, what's next? Um, can you share some advice for a listener that might be kind of either thinking about trying to find an overseas role? Or has has the opportunity on their desk at the moment? Yeah, it's um honestly for me it was such a eye opener. I mean, honestly, growing up, teenage years, early twenties, didn't go and do the gap year. It was kind of ironic. I was like, no, no, I want to wait and be able to travel on work's dime. I don't want to have to pay for it, kind of thing. Um, and so I, was, I wasn't really huge into the whole travel thing. And honestly, uh, when I moved over here, it was I was. 32, 31, 32. So, you know, was at a time where I needed to grow up, to be perfectly honest. I'd moved out of home, moved to Melbourne, done all that kind of stuff. But um, the what had kind of really developed me personally was astronomical. It's not easy. It's not for everyone. Um, but would I encourage and support and advise people to try it? Absolutely. I mean, what you can get back from it, it's going to ultimately be what you put into it. Like I said, it's, it's not for everyone though. It is really hard leaving family, friends, everything you know and what's normal behind to delve into something where as simplistic as driving on the other road, on the other side of the road. But honestly, coming here is like you were reborn. You're starting up bank accounts and phone uh, and all these things that you just take for granted back home. 
not having a credit history and all these sorts of things. So it comes with a, a really, really steep learning curve. But I mean, honestly, yeah, what, what you kind of gain back and for me, I guess, you know, the capability to then go and travel and see the world and um, spend stacks of time in Asia and Brazil and Europe and all these kind of places and be able to get that sort of cultural um, immersion more broadly has just been an absolute godsend. So for me, it'd be like, yeah, definitely if you can find people to speak to about it because there's a lot of unknown things that you need to kind of be aware of, um, visas, tax, all these types of things, the list goes on. It's pretty um, arduous, but yeah, all that stuff aside, it's 100% worth it. It's good to hear, mate. You must be happy boy over there. 2020 has been a, a wacky year so far, to say the least. Um, let's look. Let's look at the positives, though. Let's look at the opportunities that are going to come about. Um, you know, through the rest of this year and beyond, especially at Oakley or at the wider mm-hmm. industry you work in. Um, where would you Where would you guide a listener to kind of look for job and dream job opportunities in the business that you work for or the industry you work for? Yeah, good question, mate, because it's like we were kind of just chatting about before we um, we started the, the, the chat. It was, you know, it's been a crazy six months and I guess I'll start internally, like in terms of Oakley and what we've kind of done. I guess part of us, you know, whilst pretty big in the sports side of things, one of our foundational things is also kind of around protection. Um, the way our product performs exceeds so many of the industry standards and stuff like that. We've got contracts with the military um, and have had so for many, many years. So kind of, we've actually kind of been able to pivot to the point where, you know, we're now really investing into protective equipment, um, understanding, you know, one of the amazing things that always I love about this brand is just how innovative it is and the capability to work with the crew in R&D and design. And, mate, I can't even draw a stick figure and the things these guys hack up on a sketch pad in a meeting is just, phenomenal that like you just start talking and they're just they're designing away so there's huge um i guess linear opportunities but in terms of where we go how the business model evolves in terms of channels of trade e-com um etc is going to naturally change um a lot of hypotheses i guess in terms of what are the what's the consumer want when they come out of this we've been cooped up for two and a half three months People want to get back outside. They want to get active. And it's like, we've got a great opportunity to be part of that experience and part of that journey to help people, you know, really maximise that time out in in the outdoors. Um, From an industry standpoint, I'll split it in two. There's an optical component, which is probably a little more uh, stable, I guess, in some ways. People still need to get their eyes checked at the end of the day. Um, That industry's been probably less touched in the short term. Um, they're definitely, um, I guess, practice management and stuff like that and the consumer journey is definitely going to change where they're, you know, like the dentist analogy of, you know, shoving people into chairs and you kind of quick turn. It now becomes a, a much more one-on-one experience as you kind of get to spend the time with the consumer. Um, so there's going to be a lot of opportunities there in terms of customer experience um, virtual try-on tools, all these sorts of things as to how technology can evolve the space. And then in sport, similarly, that's probably a little more aligned with the brand component that I spoke to first. But, you know, there's a strong sense that people want to kind of get back outside, get active, get moving. Um, so I think that there's going to be challenges for sure. There's going to be some small brands that are going to find the last six months catch up with them and it's going to be pretty tough. Um, but I think the good ones that can kind of innovate and pivot from their core competency but still fit in their their brand ethos are going to be the ones that are ultimately going to survive. That's brilliant advice, mate. And you said curiosity earlier, and I, I can just tell from that that uh, answer you just gave that uh, there's a genuine curiosity that you've got for uh, for what's next. So um, I know you're refueled by your newest dream job, um, you know, a few months in the saddle. Uh, wish, I wish you well in that role, mate. Uh, I think great advice for any listener out there wanting to go and work for Oakley or a brand that's similar. Um, you've shared some awesome uh, skill sets uh, and, and advice, mate, and I really appreciate your time on the Dream Job Ready podcast. Yeah, thanks for your time, Dane. Wish you well with the rest of the uh, series, mate. Look forward to listening to it.